Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa out at the North Shore. Now, today we're going to look at happiness from the other side. We're going to look at unhappiness. And the title of the show is Dealing with Loss and Grief. But don't let that discourage you because the tagline for the show is Moving Back into the Sunlight. And to help us move back into the sunlight is my good friend, Daniel Lev. Daniel, welcome to the program. Hi there. <laughs> Daniel is a super therapist, and his specialty is pain. And one of the first things that I know Daniel does uh, with pain, and by the way, his moniker is the comfort doc, which I really love because he brings comfort to a lot of people. Uh, and I know that one of the first things uh, he needs to do when dealing with pain is to try to reduce the stress that people are facing. And of course, uh, loss is tremendously stressful and the resulting grief. So maybe that's a good place to start, Daniel, with if you could tell us a little bit about the relationship uh, between all those factors there. Well, certainly, uh, we're not just talking about pain, we're talking about a person's life and their lifestyle. And um, before the injury or disease or whatever brought on the pain, before that came along, they had a relatively fine life and they had things that they would expect to do. And, and then when the pain hits, they can't do a lot of those things. As you probably know, when you can't do things you really want, you start missing them, you feel their loss. And there's the grief process is part of adjusting, uh, moving from what I see of as the old normal into something you can create, which is a new normal. But that process, there's a lot of grief and, and loss and sadness, which can also stress you out. So that's the connection that I've seen over the years. Well, one of the things that really uh, gets to me is the fact that, you know, and maybe I'm just because I'm getting older, but the world seems much more stressful nowadays. Oh, yeah. um, and as this stress builds up, as catastrophe comes after catastrophe, as loss is inflicted on so many people, uh, it just becomes very, very difficult. And it seems like everybody is stressed out. Uh, people are depressed. People are anxious. Uh, they're insecure about the, the future. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you help them when things just, when the bottom falls out of things, like it has done recently with the Maui wildfires, uh, the hurricanes that the East Coast has been facing, all the floods that the world has uh, had to deal with in the last uh, month or so. Uh, maybe that's a good place to uh, take a look at how we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone from there just yet, <clears throat> but um, but it is very, uh, very understandable. And some of the first things uh, I do with someone is essentially listen and acknowledge they're going through hard times right now. You know, there's no way around it. They are experiencing loss on a lot of levels. They might have lost a loved one. They might have lost a house, uh, as in Maui. Uh, recently in Israel, the terror attacks, their people on both sides are losing lives and losing neighborhoods, and, and uh, it's really horrible. So when those things happen, as a therapist or any as a person, just to be able to be present for the person, to listen to them and to acknowledge what they're going through is the beginning. You know, really acknowledge where they are because then some relief may start happening and that's part of the grief process and be able to express your sadness and your loss you know when i was teaching psych 101 to college students uh, i talked about uh three areas uh that bring along stress uh to a person's life and that is catastrophe uh that is significant life change, and that is daily hassles. And what we're seeing today seems to combine all of that. It's like you, we can just put that all in one category because a person who's been dealing with the Maui wildfires or dealing with hurricanes or whatever, uh, there's loss of property, there's loss of their house, there's loss of financial stability, there's loss of loved ones. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's all combined. And then from then on in, things just seem to last forever. You know, the hassles that you have to go through, uh, despite the well-meaning of the government and individuals to come in to help, um, 
there's a lot of red tape that goes with that. And there's a lot of uh, misdirection that happens. And uh, it can be so discouraging. I mean, how do you help people from get discouraged? <laughs> it is hard because you're talking about the catastrophe, again, with people in pain or people with certain medical conditions or who've gone through tragic uh, catastrophes like Maui. Uh, it takes a while just to process it for our brains to say, what just happened? I was going like this just fine and then everything's gone or everything's changed or many things changed. Similarly with someone who has a chronic pain problem. I could, I remember I used to hike up a hill like this every day with my buddies. And uh, after a number of years, my knees said no. You know, my knees just hurt too much. So I had to give that up. Now that wasn't necessarily a catastrophe, <clears throat> but it was a significant life change. I could not do the exercise I used to. And you're right about those daily hassles, you know, think you get, you engage in new hassles, like just the people in Maui, I imagine just trying to get water, yeah. you know, trying to uh, uh, interact with people when you are just so angry or so hurt. Uh, it takes a while to adjust to that. That's why I'm glad there are a number of therapists and others there helping people in all kinds of ways. Well, let's talk about that adjustment because I think when people are, are faced with something catastrophic, uh, their response are, is very emotional. All of a sudden, uh, it's like a bomb has gone off, you mm -hmm. know, in your soul. And uh, all these things that were there are gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the emotions just run incredibly high. Uh, and what we have to do as therapists is we have to sort of bring them to the other side uh, to let their reason and their mind take over from their emotions so that we can get them looking for solutions and then finding solutions and maybe how to implement them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an incredibly hard task. For the individual and for the person helping them so how do we bring them from that emotional chaos that oftentimes accompanies these catastrophes into something where they can sort of pull back and start looking at how to deal with that no you're absolutely right um that it's so important to help people you know i was saying listen to them talk about the catastrophe and their loss but not just to stay there and so to help them move from that, but baby steps, little by little, okay? Because it can be very overwhelming. Even with, like I said, the people in chronic pain, it, their perspective sees the loss of the ability to do what they used to do as a catastrophe. So it's no less than someone going through an actual physical catastrophe. So how do you help them move? One way certainly is to find out what they want. That yeah. could be realistic. What would be a first small little thing you would like to try to move forward toward, okay? And uh, like this fellow I worked with, again, this is an example from chronic pain. He was stuck in a chair for a long time with a ter terrible back pain. Uh, and I said, what do you, would you like to do? Now for him, it was big. He said, I wanna work eight hours a day sitting at the computer. And he used to do that. I said, okay, you know, even that big goal, what would be the first small little step toward that goal? For him, it was five minutes. Sit there for five minutes and then take breaks. You know, so somebody whose whole life is, you know, they lost their place uh, where, where they live. What might be a first little step? Often, and this isn't just a step out of the, the loss and grief, but it's a step in general is to start to spend time with good people people who are loving and supportive. Uh, if it's hard to find somebody immediately, sometimes you can find a good therapist or a minister or a rabbi or, or uh, someone from a, a mosque or, or a Buddhist temple, some clergy person who can also be helpful, but, but connect with good people who will be caring and, and, and supportive. That goes a long way in helping people. Then the, the challenging part on my part, if I've gone through that, and I have gone through my own personal uh, catastrophes, what do I do? Well, once I kind of, my head comes up a little from the, the grief a little bit, I start to consider what is my next step? What would be another small step, as I said, but then to really write it out even, or consider it or talk with someone about it. 
this starts to make it a little more real so that what I call a new normal can start to happen. You can start moving toward that new normal, even from the ashes of the old normal. Let's let's talk about that reconnection because that uh, I have found is very hard for people, especially coming out of the lockdown from coronavirus. Oh yeah, uh, which isolated us from a lot of people that we knew and cared about, uh, and then getting back into relationships, getting back into getting in touch with people, and for a lot of people, I think it's not as easy as it used to be. And when you're faced with a catastrophe and trying to find these supported people, uh, that can be very difficult. And the people who are out there helping, who are coming in uh, from elsewhere, for instance, uh, which often happens, uh, they tend to be stressed out themselves because we're always having less help or less able to give help than we normally uh, would. And so it makes it difficult for everybody involved. Uh, one of the things that I often uh, sort of tried to move people to was not only getting in touch with people, but also seeing if there was a way that you could step to the other side as well. Um, and oftentimes when you're in a situation, a geographic situation like Maui, or uh, my last guest was from Tampa and she just had uh, Hurricane Idalia come through and create lots of problems for her friends. Uh, and so one of the things I oftentimes talk to them about was not only to reach out to get support from people, but also to give support to them. And uh, I find that that is a way to uh, sort of get people out of their own emotional angst uh, when they start focusing on other people. And strangely enough, oftentimes I think it's easier to uh, look at other people's problems uh, and deal with their help them deal with their problems than deal with your own problems, which oh, is an interesting process. For <laughs> sure. Have run across or dealt with things like this. There's just so much research on this that when you help other people, it really empowers you. It, it, it's very healthy for a person to be generous and help and healing for sure. Uh, I was thinking another way also, if it's hard to connect to an individual person, sometimes just going to a gathering. I know there's a number of gatherings that have been happening on Maui, people supporting each other, whether it's a vigil or whatever, or church or wherever you go, uh, being in the presence of people in a way that you feel, you know, safe regarding COVID, but feeling, being in that presence can also be inspiring and empowering and healing. Yeah, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what if there's uh, no group available and uh, can we inspire people to start their own group and bring people in to, uh, you know, and if you if you can't find a group, can you start your own? Oh, heck yeah. You know, I didn't tell you this, but I was in a flood in California once and we were all shoved into a, a YMCA. And you better believe one thing I noticed and I was doing this too, is people broke up into little groups. You know, some people from the same neighborhood or whatever, some knew each other, some were brand new. I was brand new. and it's amazing how people open up. Uh, I don't mean like group therapy open up. I mean, just, you know, talk and story uh, and how normalizing that is because you're in a, a difficult, abnormal situation. But being with people, it's something about our brains. We're, we're wired for, for positive social contact. And, and, and so um, doing that in some way is also very healing. You know, when you mentioned flood, immediately uh, I was I was in a flood too. Except, well, standing by uh, as the flood happened, um, I came to Hawaii in 1971. Um, but four years before that, I was in Alaska with the military, and uh, I was in Alaska just outside of Fairbanks on a mountaintop. Uh, and the big flood. Of uh, Fairbanks happened in 1967, the year I was there. And uh, you could drive a boat down, uh, or paddle a boat down the main street of Fairbanks uh, because it was so far underwater. Uh, and it was a disaster of the most devastating kind. And what we did, because I was in the Air Force, was we uh, were sort of directing the aircraft from Eielson Air Force Base, which is uh, in Fairbanks. and uh, they were coming and rescuing people, picking people up, 
mm -hmm. uh, in the wilderness uh, after their houses had washed away and uh, everything. And they would bring them to the University of Hawaii, which was up on the hill overlooking Fairbanks, so dry. And I was one of the uh, people who were meeting uh, these families and individuals who were being flown in by helicopter with nothing but the clothes on their back. And a number of the catas cat catastrophes that we've been having recently, including Maui and, uh, you know, and the hurricanes and the floods and everything, where people just wind up with, that's it. That's all they've got is stuff on their back. Well, that's what we faced in Fairbanks. And that was one of the things that made me come to love Alaska so much because the people were so strong, you know. Uh, we have here in Hawaii the aloha spirit, which is a tremendous uh, support for all of us, uh, a way to, to live life. Uh, in Alaska, it's the frontier spirit, and they came with that frontier spirit they were ready to get back in the next day and start rebuilding, you know. Uh, and it was truly amazing. But, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when we were going to do this show was if the things drag on forever, which nowadays they seem to, even the hardiest folks, even the folks that, you know, come to you and have already started adapting, or they get some of your solutions and they start getting better. Uh, all of a sudden, after weeks, months, even years, sometimes they just get exhausted. And that successful effort that they've made and the successful uh, patient that you've had, client that you've had, has you know, is recidivist, has yeah. fallen back. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with, you know, that long-term thing to bring them from short-term adaption into long-term health uh our in the way of our tagline long-term sunshine how do we how do we get them there after so long that they've been dealing with this well well we're pretty knowledgeable to know that grief doesn't stop after a year it starts to slow down but there are moments that we may remember something or re-experience it and so we'll have a challenging moment and I, sort of as an answer is to build that into your recovery. Know that at some point in the future, I may feel still some of that loss. And I'm going to make it okay. And if I need to kind of slow down a little in, in what I'm doing, that's okay. Because I will get back up on the horse again. You know, uh, there's a, a great story. I won't tell it. It's too long. But basically, the the end of it is this king wants to know, I want something that makes me happy when I'm sad and sad when I'm happy. And this little jeweler gave him a ring. And on the inside of the ring was written, this too shall pass. Everything changes. Uh, and you can be there in a way as and to make sure they change relatively in a, in a positive direction. OK, but there's going to be difficulties in life like anything else. You know, I have to tell you, everybody knows. But if we acknowledge it and not say that means that everything's everything I just did is is worthless, that's just a thought that is incorrect. So if you let that go, get through whatever down you have. Uh, so like with my clients, I say, you know, you're moving in this direction. That means you're 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 improving. But as you do that, there's ups, there's downs, there's ups, there's downs. But you're still moving in that direction. And to remind yourself, I'm going to have a new place to live. I'm going to reconnect with with my surviving friends and family or whatever it is you need to do to get through that catastrophe. Even talking with a counselor, a therapist, a clergy person uh, uh, to help you move through that. In time, it does get better. Let's let's carry that, though. There. You know, things change, like you're saying. Uh, this, too, will pass. Uh, but the new normal or the new environment that you're going to is not the same. No. Uh, and when you lose something, to me, uh, you know, and to other people that I've dealt with and tried to help, uh, there is an emptiness when you lose a special home, a special friend, mm -hmm. a special, you know, whatever. Uh, you can replace it, but... The replacement is never the same. 
It cannot you be. can't you can't replace that. Right. And there's you, there's a, there's an emptiness in there. Right. Right. And uh, and you can fill some of that up with new wonderful experiences, new friends, mm -hmm. new things that are beautiful as well. Uh, but there's going to be a part when you pick up your iPhone and you look at your iPhone and you dial in the pictures from before that catastrophe, mm -hmm. and you see that what was lost again. Right. Right. And the people and everything. Right. That's still. No matter how much we refill, there's okay. still a little thing in there that's that's empty. Well, now I'm going to talk like a rabbi for a second. Okay. okay. <laughs> At least in my tradition, and of course, there's many spiritual and cultural traditions, and some may do this as well. But when people pass away, uh, we have something called a yurt site that we we the memory of that person is is treasured that we have not lost the memories of that person, the good things they brought into the world. And in fact, there's even a, a, another level of that. Not only will I spend once a year remembering, I made recordings of my mother. And so I'll play those recordings to remember her, to talk with people. Some people have a party on the death day to remember that person and celebrate their life. But at another level comes from this great story of uh, this little boy's dog died and uh, he was just really sad, and the rabbi talked with him, and he said, well, what is something you really loved that your dog did? And he says, well, every time someone came to the door, he went and, and greeted them and barked. I said, well, you can do that, too. You can take that thing that that animal or that person brought into the world. You can carry it on. And so the little boy would always run to the door whenever someone was at the door to greet them so we can extend their presence in the world by doing some of the good things they brought into the world. True, we can't bring them into the world, but we can bring their essence into the world. And that can also empower us and make it okay to remember those losses from time to time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, and that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. One of the ways that uh, I sort of deal with that emptiness, uh, because I've lost a number of friends now, <clears throat> is to write about it. And uh, I oftentimes will recommend that. Uh, there's many ways to sort of bring back uh, and honor um, and uh, follow in the footsteps uh, because everybody has wonderful things <clears throat> uh, that you remember about them, that of the people that you hold close, whether it's friends or family. And to bring that back and to, like you say with that little kid, uh, take it and make it uh, a greeting that transcends the generations and brings that past person back uh, because you're doing what they did and you're doing what they gave to other people. Uh, that's a wonderful way of doing it. And that's uh, certainly a wonderful story. Thank you for that, Daniel. Oh, my pleasure. Well, we're getting sort of close to the uh, end, Daniel. So uh, let me go to you know, where do we, uh, well, I was going to say, where do we go? But let's make it more uh, straight. Let me just ask you, uh, if there's someone who has recently uh, gone through something like the Maui wildfires or the hurricanes or the floods, mm -hmm. they're happening all over because of climate change, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and all sorts of other factors. Um, what's one thing that uh, you would like to give them? Or a thought to leave them with it or a suggestion. If you only have one, you know, or well, maybe two, but you know, if you want to uh, give them something that uh, can sort of be an immediate, uh, you know, feel better uh, thing. It's easy give. for me to say, okay, but okay. I've noticed this is very helpful. Uh, often when people go through a loss, they stay home a lot. Mm -hmm. stay in one place and and they just kind of focus on the loss and if you're ready to start moving on in your life just get out of the house and go have an adventure get in the car take a ride get outside take a walk go take a hike it doesn't even have to be super physical go someplace and sit and look at something beautiful but going and doing things maybe some things you've never done but you thought you might want to do that can that can all kind of move into 
developing a new normal, but it's not even so much that. Just get out and and go explore the world because it's a different world because of what you went through. So see what you can discover in the world now. And some people who I've suggested this to, they actually are, are really appreciative. I knew somebody who broke their shoulder and they couldn't use it for a while, okay? Big catastrophe for them. Finally, they'd kind of rehab themselves, but they discovered exercise. They And they lost a lot of pounds and they're, they're in so much better shape. Not that yeah, I wish that they would have broken their arm early or whatever, but, but <laughs> they use that to strengthen them to move forward and they ha they discovered new things from that now and they also go out and into the world and and visit and uh have adventures so having adventures uh large or small can be very helpful well that's <clears throat> certainly a great suggestion and one that i followed during COVID. interestingly enough <clears throat> uh you know after about six months into COVID and lockdown i needed to get out exactly what you're saying yeah you need yeah. to get out and so i just got into my car and just started driving mm -hmm. and uh later i wrote a story about it called driving without destination because there was no place i could go i mean the stores were all shut down the people were all locked up i couldn't go visit people because i was afraid of infecting right. them or being infected right. by them right but i could still go out and even though I was traveling in new directions, it was an adventure because I was looking at things that I hadn't seen in a long time. Instead of looking at a destination, thinking about where I was going, I was looking around. Yeah. And I was looking at the mountains and I was looking at uh, the trees and the flowers. And uh, it was just incredibly uh, rewarding. Uh, and just a feel good moment. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for suggesting that. It certainly worked for me, and I, I think it's a uh, it's a great idea for for most people. Uh, yeah, I've and, done the same thing. So no, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got uh, well. I guess we're just about there. So just about let me there, thank yeah. you, Daniel, for. Uh, for coming and thank you for sharing your suggestions and ideas and just it's wonderful being with you again on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thanks to all of you who tuned in today. Much appreciated you being there. Thanks to all the people at Think Tech Hawaii, uh, Jay and Carol and Michael uh, and Haley, of course. Uh, now, the next show we got coming up is a delightful show that I think you're really going to enjoy in two weeks, so please tune in. It's called The Joy of Reading Children's Books with Your Family. And uh, to do that, we have the librarian up here from uh, from Boilua Library, and uh, it should be a very uh, heartwarming show. It's a heartwarming subject of coming together, which, as Daniel and I were talking about, is certainly a way to deal with uh, loss and grief and catastrophes is to come together. And we'll be doing that in two weeks. Thank you all and aloha. <laughs>